Simona Frankel, and I've got Peace Like a River. Thank you, Simona. Welcome, everybody. It's good to be with you on this uh, mild Sunday here and, uh, in May, May Sunday, uh, the 2nd, and it's Communion Sunday, so hopefully you'll have your uh, grape juice or wine with whatever you have uh, handy. Please uh, join us, and we look forward to having you. Lauren's just saying good morning, and Dottie's coming on to say good morning, so I see a lot of folks coming on, which is nice. Um, put everybody up here for a second. Whoa, yeah, everybody's coming on real fast. All right, so I'm going to give you a few announcements here while we're hanging out. There will be uh, a Sunday school today. Um, Lauren um, is going to do that. Usually we don't have one on um, Communion Sunday, but uh, because she was uh, not feeling great last Sunday, um, she's going to do one for the kids today. So there's her email. If you'd like to join and don't have the link, we'll send it to you. Um, the Thursday Bible study that I'm doing continues. Um, Tim Kelleher's book, um, From Faith to uh, Hope, From Fear to, uh, From Fear to Hope, um, is, is uh, the book that we're looking at. And uh, hopefully you can join us for that on Thursdays. The day Dottie will also be doing her Zoom coffee hour. Um, and you can join us at uh, after worship. Um, and the email for Dottie's right there. And again, we send out the link in our bulletin. So you should have all of that in case... Yeah, and Dottie's going to put it in the chat right now as well so that we can uh, make sure everybody knows what's going on. Let's see here. Oh, my goodness, i got so many people here. <laughs> so let me just see if I can add a few more just so uh, people can see who's coming on and say hi to one another. Uh, it's great to see you. Kirk and Debbie, I want to wish you a happy 40th wedding anniversary today. Um, it's great to see both of you guys. Um, and uh, it's good to have you here, Charlie. Uh, always um, and uh, oh, wanted to let you know we're going to be in person worshiping on May Sunday, May twenty third. That's Pentecost Sunday, and so hopefully, if you are fully vaccinated, please feel free to come back and join us in person. We'll also be coming to you live streaming as well. But uh, it's going to be nice to kind of do things once again in person, and we'll have a brief uh, little luncheon afterward. All of it, of course, boxed and protected, so you guys won't have to worry about anything. But uh, we think it'd be a nice way to start. I'm going to have the men's fellowship here on uh, Saturday, May 15th. Um, and uh, I'll have a smoked salmon and uh, some other goodies. So please come and join us for that. We'd love to have you. Um, I see people from all over the place now coming on, which is great. And here's Dottie's link, by the way, for the coffee hour. I'm just posting that up there so that you can all see it. Um, Another happy birthday and happy anniversary coming here um, from Dottie. Jennifer, good to see you, kiddo, too. Um, Denise, all right, nice to see you, kiddo. Fred, nice to have you here from Virginia. My sister Sue from Boston. Sophie, all right, so many good folks coming on. It's great. Um, <clears throat> at this time, let me give us our thought for the day, which goes like this. It comes from Willie Jennings. I don't know who this person is, but I like the thought. Christians still read the Bible strangely. We read it as if we were the point of the Bible, as though we are or never were the Gentiles, and yet we are, and here we are. Our <clears throat> call to worship is in our bulletin. Please join with me, if you will, in it. The vine emerges from the earth, nourished and nourishing. It rises without visible connection, Roots hidden, promises unknown, strong to withstand storms, fragile when plucked too soon. So it is that we grow, nourished by invisible connections to the living God, called to nourish that which is seen and that which is yet buried within us. We gather to praise the Lord of these hidden promises and treasures that lie within each and every one of us. We gather to worship the Lord of visible connections through those who have gathered here with us today and continue to support and love one another. At this time, let me put on our opening hymn. I've got Peace Like a River by our choir. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. i 
job choir thank you and our confession uh, goes like this gracious God when we put off until tomorrow our response to your call forgive us when our good intentions are not followed by good actions have patience with us when we burden and harden our hearts and seek to be right rather than faithful to your will and teachings have mercy on us and today when we hear your voice may we rise up to obey and follow where it leads so that we might become a blessing to those that you have already blessed. Amen. Take a few moments now to be in silence and in prayer with God. Amen. <clears throat> God's word to us is a word of forgiveness, a word of assurance. It's a word of grace. We are loved and accepted because we are we and God is God. And nothing can finally separate us from our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Also want to put up one last announcement. Amen, by the way, to that. Um, that on May 20th, uh, we will have a blood drive at the church for anybody who would like to come by between 1 and 7 p.m. Uh, at the First Presbyterian Church of Hackensack. And thank you for that, Betty. Appreciate you putting that up there and make sure that we'll do that. I'd like to put on our scripture reading. It comes from Matthew Forbes. One of our young folks who's been growing up in our church, just a delightful man, great family, uh, and enjoy. This reading comes from John 15, verses 1 through 8. Jesus, the true vine. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that bears no fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already made clean by the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If a man does not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and withers. And branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. This is the word of God. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks be to God. That is the word of the Lord. I've entitled this sermon, The Risky Business of Producing Fruit. A few months ago, <clears throat> my sister had a surprise birthday party that was put on by my niece, her daughter, it was a wine tasting party that we did virtually via Zoom with a wine sommelier from out in California who asked us to describe the tastes of the wines that we were sent in little packets, which was interesting. I'm not a wine drinker, but some in my family really are, and I uh, started to learn about wine through them first and foremost, but then I started to do a little research for this sermon because it talks about vine management. And there's a guy by the name of Daniel Sog of Wine Spectator magazine who's written an article and, and he appears periodically in their magazine on all things wine. If you want to go broke really fast, he says, go into the wine business. Next to the food business, the restaurant industry, it's one of the riskiest businesses you can go into. Besides the financial and the atmospheric risks, the weather, facing you, there are several issues that must be addressed in order to make good wine. And one of them that's frequently overlooked is vine management. It's important to understand this aspect of the wine business if we're going to understand what Jesus is talking about in John's gospel. Jesus said he is the gardener. And the gardener cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes. In a nutshell, or maybe I should say in a grape skin, that's what vine management is all about, knowing when to cut, when to harvest, when to prune, and when to cultivate. 
But here's the problem that buying management really is about and what it addresses. It's about runaway growth. Vines left to themselves will sprawl out all over the place and produce huge canopies of shoots and leaves and branches. And unless that canopy is controlled, the vine won't yield many good grapes because all of the energy will be going into the vine and into the leaves rather than into the fruit. It's a bit like turning into a skid to prune back the canopy. At first, it strikes us as something that's against our common sense because all of that greenery, all of those leaves suggest that what you've got here is a very healthy vine. But in fact, it's all just show and tell. Jesus is afraid that the disciples might face the same problem as they go out and start their own flocks. He wasn't interested in showy disciples any more than he's interested in showy churches or showy Christians today. What he's interested in is the fruit, and just fruit, but excellent fruit. For example, pick up a glass of California Sauvignon Blanc, and after sniffing the bouquet of it, swirling it around in the glass, examining the claret, and performing other tests that help you to affect your best Fraser and Niles Crane impressions, take a sip. Daniel Sog, again, a wine spectator, says that if you can catch a flavor reminiscent of an onion skin or of a jalapeno pepper, you've just encountered the problem that vine management is seeking to address. A very huge canopy of vines may be looking good, but it isn't doing any good to the vine or to the fruit that it's seeking to produce. It reminds me a little bit of the BBC comedy Keeping Up Appearances. And in it, there's a matronly woman by the name of Hyacinth. But she has only one concern in her life, and that's to maintain the illusion that she is well-bred and in touch with the upper crusts of British society and the lower layers of nobility. That's why when her neighbor drives Hyacinth to her sister's home, she instructs her neighbor to park the car in front of a well-appointed house on the street. And after asserting that it's her sister's home, she leaves her neighbor in the car, dashes to the door, then ducks around to the side, climbs a six-foot brick wall in her dress, heels, flowered hat, and falls to the ground, gets up, brushes herself off, and marches to her sister, sister's actual abode, which is a run-down tenement building the next street over. Hyacinth is concerned about her canopy, about the outward appearance of how she appears to everybody. The image of the vine is used in several places throughout all of Scripture as a metaphor for the relationship between God and God's people. Israel is described as the vineyard of the Lord Almighty in Isaiah 5. And Jesus picks this image up again in our scripture, John 15, in describing his relationship to his disciples. A grapevine really is a community when you think about it. Many individual branches, like us, individuals, yet interconnected and intertwined with one another, making up what is the body of Christ, but all of it designed for the sole purpose of bearing good fruit. And while the individual branches are important, it's the collective quality of the whole crop that determines whether the wine will be labeled as excellent, mediocre, or simply sold by the box. God, like any good winemaker, understands the need to control the canopy. The goal of vine management, then, is threefold. First, you want to develop a vine structure that makes picking and disease control relatively easy. With a huge covering of branches and large leaves, it's difficult to see the fruit, let alone pick it. You've got to dig through it, actually, to find it. And herein lies the problem for the church and all of us. Sometimes the external paraphernalia, the rules, the doctrines, our government, so to speak, even the accoutrements of the church get in the way, not of growing the fruit, but of picking it. We used to call it legalism, right? Our conventions and our traditions sometimes keep the world from seeing the actual fruit that we're producing. And seeing no fruit, a lot of fruit ends up rotting on the vine and going to complete waste. We grow, therefore, under the watchful eye of a community around us that gets to know us, hopefully, and that we get to know. The world is full of people searching for truth and for meaning in life, for a sense of purpose, and we have good news to offer those people. The fruit is hanging lush from our branches, but we tend to hide it behind closed doors and meaningless, and meaningless appearances of non-essential issues. Doing uh, or using another metaphor, Jesus called it hiding our light under a bushel basket. 
The church has lots of fine baskets, but the world doesn't need more baskets. It needs more light. It needs more truth. It needs more abundance of life. The world doesn't need shoots, leaves, and branches. It needs excellent fruit. Are we going to allow God to prune back the canopy of our lives, to let our fruit be visible to the world that's walking by us all the time? And the second goal, therefore, of what vine management is all about is to regulate the size and the quality of the fruit. Sog tells us in his article that a huge crop buried underneath a dense thicket of vegetation translates into lousy wine. God is concerned about the quality of the wine, you see. He wants a superior product, not just an average, mediocre product. He wants the best product possible. The mantra of the church for over a generation has been church growth. Church growth. We need to grow the church. Notice, however, that Jesus doesn't call the vine to growth. He calls it to produce great fruit. Our mantra ought to be church fruit, producing good fruit. When God takes the pruning shears to your life, or to the church, it's not an issue of whether you are growing, but what are you growing exactly? There will always be some fruit, unless the branch is completely dead, but the larger issue is the one of quality of the fruit you are bearing. A sour grape is a fruit, but it's still a sour fruit. And finally, the aim of vine management is to strike a balance between growing leaves and growing fruit. Without shoots, leaves, and branches, you won't have any fruit. We are not people without a life that's interconnected to all aspects of other lives. And within it, we need a well-disciplined life in which fruit can grow. God wants us to have a life, but he tells us he wants to have and get an abundance of it from us. He wants to give us an abundance of life, not just simply getting by in life. But it must be a life that is disciplined. It has to have some control in it. A life that is best suited to render the fruit of the Spirit, therefore, involves things like prayer and study and worship and communities of faith, gathering together to share the good news. So what are we to do? Jesus says that we must abide in him. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches and cut off from me you can do nothing, but in me all things become possible. God is the one who watches over the whole process of growth, from beginning to end. But we must abide in God. And if we go it alone, well, we'll just dry up and become so much dead wood that God can only use us, finally, as fuel for the fire. Which, by the way, is still good, in the sense that without the fire, there would be no transformation of the fruit into wine or into other things. So it's not a punishment we're assigned to, but it is another source of what God's purpose is all about. Sog concludes that with proper vine control, a winemaker is able to produce a wine that is a friend to all kinds of food. You can eat it with red meat and white meat. You can eat it with fish and fowl. You can eat it in all kinds of places and at all kinds of times. There is no one right season for any color or taste of wine. Do you like it? Does it go well with what you want to eat? What Jesus is saying, therefore, to his disciples is that with proper vine management, they can produce a fruit that is a friend of faith. And if you're wondering what that fruit should look and taste like, it's this, says the Apostle Paul. The fruits of the Spirit, the tastes of the Spirit, are like this. They are love, they are joy, they are peace, they are patience, they are kindness, they are goodness. They are faithfulness, they are gentleness, they are self-control. So if we live by the Spirit, let us therefore also walk by the Spirit, Paul says, knowing exactly what the fruits are like, patience and kindness. We can abide in him. We know what he desires. We know how to grow it. So let us begin the process now anew. Amen. At this time, let me put on a hymn for us. <clears throat> Dvorak's God is My Shepherd by Jody Sinkway. Take it away, Jody.
Wow, Jody, that was really amazing. Not only your voice, but also the graphics. Thank you for putting that together. Really nice. At this time, we're going to do one of the things that I think is one of the more important things that we do each week, which is the prayers of the people. And so I want to ask you guys at this time, if you want to post concerns or joys, um, that you do so, and we'll lift those up as a community of faith to hold in prayer this coming week. I want to give thanks um, for... Um, Betty's good news that she tested negative um, uh, for all kinds of good things, meaning that uh, she's going to be fine going forward. So um, I'm really happy about that. I just want to also just say people are telling us uh, just how nice a job you did, um, Jody. So um, let me just uh, post some of these up for us. Um, also from Charlie. Hang on, buddy. Let me get you down here so I can get you. Great news for Betty. Thanks. God's prayers for my brother who is going to be having a serious back surgery. Pray God makes him well. Happy anniversary to Debbie and Kirk. Again, let me take this off so that we don't have so much competition going on with the screens. And um, we're excited for Debbie and Kirk as they celebrate their 40th wedding anniversary. And uh, they're, uh, Charlie is excited about getting the sanctuary all fixed up. It's looking good. We've got folks in there working their tails off. Um, and KB lifts up prayers for continued balance. Um, that's always the, the key, isn't it? We want to Try and live a balanced life. Uh, can, uh, from Susan, dear Susan Herman, uh, continued prayers for my heart, which is an arterial fibrillation, which is not a great thing, obviously. So, Susan, we're going to pray for healing for your heart to beat at the correct rate and not to just half beat, so to speak. Um, keeping the tempo right. All right. Thanks, kiddo. Um, from Barb Thomas, also good news from Karen. Um, she's not going to need any further treatments. Uh, they got everything I'm understanding from the surgeon's report and Barb's report. So that's fantastic. And, uh, Charlie, again, just to thank Jody, uh, on a job well done. Um, beautiful job guys. Also just, uh, keep, uh, my family in your prayers. Um, everybody's doing well, not my mother-in-law. Um, she's, you know, still struggling. She will be probably for the remainder of her life. So, um, please, um, keep her and our family in your prayers. Prayers of Thanksgiving from Debbie. Hang on, sorry. Whoa, they're popping in fast and furious right now. Debbie for a successful surgery for Sophie. That's another great. Yeah, we had a lot of good news this week. A lot of people had surgeries, but all of them have come through it shining, which is great. Um, a friend, Claire, who was placed in hospice. Um, and uh, so we'll keep that family in, in our prayers. Hospice out here, at least, is doing a great job. I've been involved with it for a long time. Uh, and they take great care of people, by the way. And from Stephen Shaw. Stephen, it's great to see you. Our love goes out to you and your uh, lovely wife, Heather. Prayers for our friend, Kara, who lost her dad uh, to a heart attack while snowball snowmobiling with her sons. Well, that's really sad and tragic, isn't it? So sorry to hear that. Um, and then Kirk, yeah, man. Thanks, everybody, for the anniversary wishes. Feels amazing. Yes, it does. 
Uh, it's cool, man. You got a great marriage. You got a great family, buddy. Uh, thanks to KB from Betty. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for prayers from First Presbyterian Church from Karen. Uh, absolutely, kiddo. I always love to see you every week. It's really nice, man. Appreciate all of you guys coming on. All right. How about I close this part out with a word of prayer and then the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray together this. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the rains that wake up the earth and provide the nourishment for the vines that grow the fruit. We ask that you would grow us and heal us, that you would keep us in control, so to speak, of our emotions, that you would make us into people who bear the fruits of the Spirit that Paul so beautifully describes in his passage in Galatians kindness and loveliness and gentleness and patience, all those good things. We ask that you would abide in us as you have, as your son has abided in you and who taught us his prayer to say together, saying these words together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, at this time, I'll put on a few more um, posts just from people that have come on. It's great to see Doreen as well. Thank you, kiddo. Um, and we really appreciate all of that. Also, just again, to say thank you to all of the folks out there who contribute to our church and its ministries. Uh, as we get moving forward, we're doing a lot of renovations to the building so that we can have groups of all kinds using our facility uh, so that we might be a real service to um, our community, uh, especially as we come out of the COVID lockdowns. So if you can help us out, it's always appreciated, and we sure do uh, appreciate your offerings and your support. Let me put on our doxology as we conclude this part of our service here. Appreciate it. Beautiful job. As we get ready now to celebrate our communion with our Lord over the Lord's Supper, I just would encourage you all to gather your bread and or whatever you're going to use with your grape juice or wine at this point in our service. And just the invitation is very simple. Those of us, all of us at some time or another have felt overburdened and heavy weighted. And Jesus, come unto me. All, and Jesus says, come unto me, all of you who feel like that. For he says, my yoke, which is his interpretation of the law of God, what God wants, is an easy one to bear because it boils down to very simply love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and your neighbor as yourself. If you do this, he says, it will be easy for you because I will be walking with you, bearing that burden along with you. And this is a commandment that you can remember. And so when we gather around the Lord's table, we are reminded of the great sacrifice that he made on behalf of all of us as he was readying himself for the cross. But also, and more importantly, and part of that same story was the resurrection that blew the world away, first appearing to just the women, and then eventually to Peter, and then to the other 11, then to Thomas, and then coming up on Pentecost, he will appear to over 500 people, and they will understand everyone in their own language what Peter preaches about the risen Christ that, that Sunday that we celebrate the birth again and the rebirth of our church. Looking forward to it. So at this time, let me ask you to grab your bread and let me say this, that on the night that he sat at the table with the disciples, he took the bread and having blessed it, he tore it in two and he said, this now is my body, which is broken for all of you. Take and eat until I come to be with you again. And then in like fashion, Jesus, having taken the cup and the chalice, he said now, as he poured out the wine, he said, this cup now is a sign of a new covenant that is to be sealed in my blood. As often as you take and drink of this, you, of this cup, 
you proclaim not only the Lord's death, but his resurrection. And the resurrection has promised all of us yet to come. As he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Cut off from me, you can do nothing. But in me, all things become possible. Honey, let me serve you here. And uh, just tear off a piece of the bread. And while we're doing this, I'm going to put on a little communion music for us, guys. Holy, 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 God Almighty, Lord, holy, 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 everywhere adored. Choir. Beautiful job again, guys, as always. Our prayer of communion, our unison prayer of communion, is in the bulletin that was sent out. Please join with me in this unison prayer if you can. God of grace, you come to us in our pain and you become our healer. You come in our sorrow and you comfort us. You come in our anger and provide love and forgiveness. You come in our complacency and apathy and challenges. You come in our hunger and thirst and remind us that you are the bread and the wine of life. We are grateful and we will remember the price that you have paid so that we might have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Our closing hymn is from our choir, How Firm a Foundation. How firm a foundation he saves of the Lord benediction goes like this. There is a well in this place filled with care, mutual acceptance, strength, and love. Supplied by God and challenged by God, it is kept fresh by people you see and hear near you now and every week, whether it's virtually or whether it's in person. You and I have contributed to this source, and we have also drawn from this source. By the grace of God, it never empties out. The source of love and forgiveness and transformation continues each and every day. It is called the church, the body of Christ, the people of God, the communion of believers. Brothers and sisters, we can touch and love, surrounded by God's presence here and everywhere that we walk. Know that in him you are loved. 
and blessed. So go out and be a blessing to others. Our postlude is Simona Foundation. Enjoy as we conclude this service and join us for coffee hour and Sunday school following this. Sunday. God bless. Amen.